Hello everybody and this is and good, wo good evening and welcome. My name is Mark. <laughs> We're here with our guest, Barbara. Well, Hello, Barbara, how are you? I'm doing well, Mark. What about you? How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing really well today. And thank you for having me here today. Oh, you're welcome. It is a pleasure. <laughs> so, <clears throat> tell us a bit more about yourself. Where are you from? Well, actually, I am from Hartford, Connecticut. I was born uh, June 16, 1902 mm -hmm. in Hartford, Connecticut to two amazing parents, parents sorry, Thomas Henry and Sarah. Uh, I'm the four, third child of four children. And I was, actually, if I'm honest with you, my name's not Barbara. <laughs> my real name is not Barbara. Wait, wait a second. Did you just say that your name isn't Barbara? Well, I mean, now it is. Now my name is Barbara, but I was actually born Eleanor. My my actual name was Eleanor. Like Eleanor Roosevelt? Kind of like Eleanor Roosevelt, yes. Just like her. Was she your grandmother? No. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. Oh, okay. <laughs> but okay. Are, do, you, do you want to know why? Why? My mother, my parents decided to call me Barbara now. Well, you see, yeah. I first... I was Eleanor, as I already mentioned, but my mother and father thought that I was a bit too crazy and not very feminine-ish, and so, or feminine-like, and so they thought that Eleanor was too ladylike for me, and decided that, nope, your name is not Eleanor anymore, you're Barbara. So, that's how Barbara came to be. Barbara McClintock at your service. Interesting. <laughs> Amazing. Now you're going to remind me of Barbara Gordon. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, ha, ha. <laughs> so, uh -huh. Barbara, where did you go to school? Um, I went to school in Cornell to Cornell University in New York. I it was a very great school and a very great opportunity for me. After my mother finally decided to let me go, because at first she thought that I shouldn't go to college. She wanted to meet just like every other woman at home, married with children, and I was like, I that's not the life for me. I do not want to be a stay-at-home mom. Who's the traditional person around here? No one, right? Okay. <laughs> Let's continue. No, so All right, yeah, then. Yeah, so in that school, carry off from the whole, you know, being a stay-at-home mom, I told her, no, I want to leave. And so she, she finally gave in. My parents were always very open to letting me be who I was. And so I finally left the university, and in 1921, I took my first genetics class there in it was very, very fascinating. It was actually a very great experience for me. So did you ever believe in your future that you want to have children? <laughs> no. I don't think I'd ever want children. Well, that's sad. Anyway. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, it's not me. I, I'm a very uh, open person and free. I, I like being able to do what I want to do. I never even had a, a relationship with anybody. Wow. I was always very occupied in my laboratory. Focus. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> who influenced you and who encouraged your research, Barbara? Tell me. So, I'd say that my first influence was my father. You see, he was um, a family doctor, and he was very, very great, very interesting to see how much he knew and how he was able to cure people with from different illnesses. And I was like, you know what? I want to do the same thing. Maybe not exactly what he does, but I want to know more too. I want to grow mentally as well. And so he was my first influence to want to leave my home and go and discover more. But I think that my second greatest influence was my genetics class. After I decided, I took my genetics class and I learned more about genetics, I, I expanded from there. I took botany. And in botany, I, I learned more about the genetics and plants. And then from there, I went to cytogenetics, which was something that was also very influential, influential for me because from there I discovered many of the genes uh, processes through maize. Interesting. You said maize? Yes, maize. You don't know what he calls that anymore. They uh, call that's it a corn. scientific name, my friend, maize. <laughs> so we're going to be now like grown-up maize, maize, maize. It's amazing. <laughs> of course, it's very amazing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what is your career research now? Tell me. Well, um... My most current current research, I would say, was probably where I dis was discovering more about transposons. So, transposon. Hey, wait, what is a transposon? A transposon is a little piece of DNA. We'll call this a jumping gene, so to say, because th that's what it literally does. It jumps. It jumps. Yes. <laughs> oh. It jumps off from the regular DNA it's in, 
and it transfers itself to some other place, place in, in another dream. How I mean, another cell. Well, I was still in the verge of discovering more about that, but apparently, it's like these little pieces of DNA have this kind of coding that'll make them go into other places, and they just have like a kind of like a mind of their own, and they just go off, take themselves, pick themselves up, and take, transfer themselves to another gene. And currently, it's not my research, but another individual, a doctor named Dr. Dubnay, he is actually going off from what I discovered from my, um, uh, my transpose on discovery and realizing, he's a neuroscientist, realizing that he could potentially use its ability for neuromedicine. So he can see that in humans, which is in, in like other insects like flies, is where he was able to visualize how these transposons were actually moving from one part part to another and how they were not literally maybe not negatively affecting it, but from this same jumping he could use something that could positively affect the brain. So he, have, he could be visual, visual the brain. Yes, sir. You, you know how you know how mosquitoes suck some, on one's blood? Yes. Doesn't the DNA get mixed with theirs? A good question, uh, no, because technically all they do is consume it. It goes straight to their stomach and they're not really making it a part of themselves. They're just consuming our blood. The problem is that their proboscis, the one, with they, the one that they suck their blood with, contains blood from another individual. And so that's how we get infected with someone else's diseases. And so they actually, because they're the ones concerning in us, they can actually give us their own Daddy. because their their own liquids and fluids that Daddy. they're releasing into us are the ones that have the genetic trend, uh, genetic um material that can actually get into us. But no, technically they cannot get our genes put into them. It's not the same thing. They're feeding off of us, but then they transmit to us the disease through their own liquids because they go into our bloodstream directly. Interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> now, where was I? Um, oh. <clears throat> where, how, where Where? are you now? So, technically speaking, I'm dead. Oh. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. I passed away in 1992. About 25 years ago. For exact. 25 years ago. Um, I died at the age of 90. Uh, natural causes. Um, it was a nice, peaceful, peaceful death. <laughs> yeah, I was, um, later on I was then buried in Huntington, um, Huntington Cemetery, and, um, but yeah, I mean, I feel like my legacy still keeps going. I feel like I'm not dead, so I'm still here in the hearts of, of all those amazing scientists who still want to study genetics. So you feel that, learn about me. that you are, you are an inspiration for others? I hope I am. I hope that a little bit of what I did as a normal human being who had just a lot of love and passion for science could be of, of great influence to other individuals who are looking for the same thing in the same path. So yeah. hopefully, <laughs> hopefully I'm doing the same for them. Hopefully, well, just like science was once an inspiration for me, I'm being an inspiration for them to well, learn more about science. Well, before you ever began anything, before even you died, let, did you ever have an idea of being a scientist when you were little? Did you ever believe or thinking that, that you could I do was, that? That I was going to do this? No. I would have never imagined that this was going to be my life. It was, it's been quite a, a fascinating journey. And who would have guessed that I would have discovered chromosomal crossover? I mean, I couldn't even believe it myself when I first discovered it. And Harriet, Harriet and Creighton, which I, I rarely even included in my, in my, um, present my here my interview here she was of great help for me too and i don't even think she knew that she was going to be such a great a great scientist and was ever going to was ever able going ever be able to discover something like this as well as me well speaking about harriet creighton did were you did you ever knew each other before you became before you started working together uh she was actually my student uh, she was a student there at the school where I was working at, and she was technically my student as well. And we started to uh, know, the, figure out that we had a lot of connection between each other, and we were like after kind of the same things, and so we became partners. And from that partnership, we discovered many things. But yes, yeah, she was my student before we ever started anything. Did you ever be got a strong relationship, like your friends, almost to sisters? Um, we were close, but I really loved my person, my 
personal space in my distance. I was never the kind of person that I was like uh, dependent on other people. No, I, I really always wanted to have things under my control. I wanted to be in charge of what I wanted to do. So I never had that proximity with many people because I was seeing, I guess, it's kind of a selfish ish looking person who, who wanted just to have that control, personal control of everything that she did. So yeah, unfortunately I didn't have many friends, but I was a very joyous, very playful, very, you know, funny kind of hangout girl. You know, I, I loved, I loved having fun. I was just not ever that close to people as I would have probably preferred to be. Interesting. Yeah. So, so yeah. do you, wait, did you ever, um, uh, what happened? <laughs> um, how did it feel being a teacher? Like I've never, obviously, I've never been a teacher since I am a show host, right, people? <laughs> um, um. Anyway, uh, uh, <laughs> so how did you have that like being? Uh, yeah, um, thank you everybody for coming. Have a good evening and have a very nice day. This is the end of our show. Thanks for having me here. You're welcome. <laughs>